Welcome back to Backyard Politics. I'm Nikki. I took a couple of days off this last week. Uh, I needed a mental health break. Um, been waking up in the middle of the night with panic attacks because of all of this COVID stuff and finances, and I just needed to take a break. So I'm back, and the channel's back, and we have uh, important info to get to. So Ryan Grimm from The Intercept and Katie Halper um, they broke a story, um, about Tara Reed. Her real name is Alexandra Reed. Uh, she accused Biden and has been accusing him of sexual assault. So if there's any kids within earshot of this video, you might want to have them leave the room. Um, so Katie Helper says, this is a story that Alexandra Reed, known, also known as Tara Reed, has been trying to tell since it happened in 1993. It's a story about sexual assault, retaliation, and silencing. Tara had already come forward about part of her story. After Lucy Flores accused Biden of touching her inappropriately, Reed was one of the seven other women to share her own stories to share their own stories about Biden. Reed told reporters about the way he would put his hands on her shoulders run his fingers up and down her neck, she considered talking about the rest of her story, but she didn't because her claims of sexual harassment got doxxed and smeared as a Russian agent. That was April 2019. Then in January 2020, Reed tried to come forward again. So, if you ever talk bad about the establishment, you're smeared as a Russian agent these days. Sound familiar? This time... January 2020, when she tried to come out. Uh, she tried to come out to Time's Up, which is also the Me Too movement. As Ryan Grimm reported at The Intercept, the organization said they couldn't help her because Biden was a candidate for federal office and supporting a case against him could jeopardize their nonprofit status. So they can go after Republicans like Kavanaugh and uh, Trump and people like that, but they can't go after, sorry, that's my phone, but they can't go after, um, Democrats. Okay. Grimm also pointed out that the public relations firm that works on behalf of the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund is SKD Knickerbocker, whose managing director, Anita Dunn, is the top advisor to Biden's presidential campaign. Let me repeat this. The Time's Up movement, who was put in place to protect women who come forward on these accusations, about these accusations, said they couldn't help her because Biden was a candidate for federal office and supporting a case against him could jeopardize their nonprofit status. Grimm also pointed out that, quote, the public public relations firm that works on behalf of the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund is also SKD Knickerbocker, whose managing director, Anita Dunn, is the top advisor to Biden's presidential campaign. Wow. Not surprisingly, there were no witnesses to the alleged sexual assault, but Tara's brother and her good friend, each of whom I've spoken with, recall being told about the assault by Tara at the time. This is a story that should have been looked into. Tara reached out to countless people to try to get her story out. Nobody would. Not even the one organization that was made to support women like her. Oh, this is just classic and frustrating and disgusting and terrible and sad and not surprising. Hello and welcome to the Katie Helper Show. Please rate and review the Katie Helper Show on iTunes. So this is a um, quick clip of, well, it's not very quick, but it's a clip of um, what she was talking about and Tara Reid's um, accusations against Biden. And if you like the show, you can support it at Patriot Revealed, but she, who's managing director at her neck, almost immediately after sharing at her neck, almost 
Last spring, after Nevada politician Lucy Flores shared that Biden had touched her inappropriately, Tara was one of seven women who came forward to discuse Joe Biden of similar misbehavior. At the time, she told the local reporter that when she worked as a staff assistant for Joe Biden's Senate office in the early 90s, he would put his hands on her shoulder, run his fingers up and down her neck. Almost immediately after sharing her own story, Tara was doxxed and smeared. There was more to Tara's story than she had revealed, but she felt too vulnerable to tell it. Then in January, she approached Time's Up, the nonprofit organization which helps women share their Me Too stories. As we now know from a March 24th Ryan Grimm article at The Intercept, Time's Up told Tara they couldn't help her because funding a Me Too allegation against Joe Biden could threaten their tax-exempt status. As Grimm also points out, the public relations firm that works on behalf of the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund is SKD Knickerbocker, whose managing director, Anita Dunn, is the top advisor to Biden's presidential campaign. Tara finally tells her story for the first time on this interview. I spoke to her this week, and I want to warn listeners that Tara describes an alleged sexual assault. There were no witnesses, but her close friend and her brother, both of whom I spoke to, remember Tara telling them about the incident at the time. You will hear a few beeps during the episode. That's where I beeped at the name of one of Tara's immediate superiors. So Tara Reed, thank you so much for talking to me. Um, where would you like to start? Where does the story start for you? Um, well, the story starts when I went to work for Joe Biden. That was um, in uh, 92. And so I was hired um, that fall, the year that Bill Clinton um, was inaugurated as our president. So I was in, uh, before that, I was out west and I had worked on a congressional race um, before I was working in politics, I was um, an actress and a model, and I had studied classically, and I really loved the arts, and I come from a family of arts and activists and whatnot. And um, then I got interested in college in political science, and I went and interned for Leon Panetta when he was a congressman and worked on an animal rights issue that ended up being um, put into law and signed into law, so it was very exciting. and. It was a very successful experience. And then um, when I applied for Joe Biden's office, I had a phone interview. And then they um, offered to interview me in person. And so I went out to D.C. and I interviewed in person. And when I was there, uh, the scheduler interviewed me and uh, Joe Biden happened to walk Breeze past and he uh, saw me and uh, she introduced me. And we were in the inner kind of alcove office and uh, he asked me my name. I told him and he said, oh, that's a good Irish name. And she offered to him, hey, she worked as an intern for you know, Panetta. And he's like, oh, he's a good guy. And then he looked back and smiled at me and said, hire her. Mm. And then, hey. And um, the scheduler looked at me and said, I guess you're hired. Mm. <laughs> what was the position for it? It was for a staff assistant position. So I, um, you know, pretty low on the totem pole, but you're able to like work through it. So I was working with um, the intern. So I supervised the intern program and um, made, sh- made sure like, you know, all the mail was distributed where it was supposed to the interns did that and trained them and worked um, for legislative aides. I would like help go to a hearing and take notes or write oh, something. kind of fun. Them. Yeah. So it's sort of like you just did what you had to do. All hands on deck, sort of, too. Mm-hmm. And you were how old at this point? Mid-20s. And how long did you work for Biden in total? Nine months. You um, would later come forward after Lucy Flores came forward about something that happened um, in 93. Yes, and I actually did come forward um, in 93, but not to the press, but I, I went through protocol and complained. What was your complaint about? sexual harassment. Um, I did not uh, complain formally about the other piece of what happened that I'll talk about in a few minutes, but um, I talked about what was witnessed um, and uh, the general atmosphere of the office, the way I was treated, because I would see him at meetings and he would basically put his hands on me, put his hands on my shoulder, um, run his finger on my neck. He was very like handsy with a lot of people, Mm -hmm. but like with it's it's like what I had and I 
I have said this that's in the press before from the last time. Um, it, it made me feel like an inanimate object. I didn't feel like a person. He, mm-hmm. he didn't like make conversation with me or talk with me or ask me anything relevant. It was just, you know, it, it was definitely that kind of vibe. So it was uncomfortable. So it was really after that incident when I walked in and everyone was arguing, I was called into the office and I was very nervous because I thought I did something wrong. Like I remember feeling almost sick to my stomach, nervous, like, you know, this was a big deal getting called in rather than them just coming and talking to me. When I walked in, people's voice were raised. They were arguing and that there was a legislative assistant. She was a senior aide. Um, she worked on women's issues, I believe, among other issues. I know judiciary issues for sure. But anyway, she turned to me and she um, and said, the senator thinks that you have um, that you're pretty and that you have nice legs and he wants you to serve drinks at this event fundraising event. And you don't have to do that, Tara. You don't, you know, that's not part of your job. And then the scheduler came in right after she kind of interrupted her in the middle of what she was saying and then said whatever she said. And I can't remember everything that was exchanged, but basically then everyone kind of looked at me and I just froze because I didn't know what to say to anybody. And um, it was uncomfortable. And I knew that no matter what I decided to do, um, I was going to either, you know, make my my immediate supervisor very unhappy or I was going to look bad in the eyes of this person, the legislative, you know, assistant who was sticking up for me, obviously, and didn't think I should be objectified. So it was a it was a strange position to be in. And I just left. I didn't say anything, actually. And um, I called my mom and she was very adamant that I document it and file a report. And she said, you know, and her exact words were, and I remember because we got into like a little bit of an argument about it, but she said, um, you just march in there and you tell them this is sexual harassment and, you know, and you file a complaint. And I (laughs) tried to explain to my mother that it wasn't easy. You couldn't just march into Ted Kaufman's office, who was the chief of staff, and that there was a protocol and that there was a way to to do that. And my mother was very, um, she just said, you know, you tend to be a little passive sometimes, you know, sometimes you stick up for yourself, but sometimes, you know, you, you let people take advantage of you. You need to stand up and you need to address this. So I already kind of had those feelings, but that was that point. I knew I, I wanted to, to look at taking some action. So I did a a non-formal thing by just going to my supervisor. That's when I was met with some of her attitude about the whole thing. Like, why wasn't I complimented? You know, you know, that people would be flattered to be liked by Joe Biden. And, you know, what basically she was also admonishing me to keep my head down if I wanted to last, she said that a couple of times and um, she took me in the hallway a couple of times and just was very, you know, kind of chewed me out a few times um, and nothing was in writing, but the time from frame for me from this event to when I met him with the gym bag and the incident is compressed for me. And I don't know like how much time passed, but I do know a couple of things happened between those two events one of them that was significant was being told I had to dress differently and that I was too provocative. And that was by the assistant and by the scheduler. And, uh, and they were finding fault with my work all the time, like every little thing. And it was almost to the point where three or four times a day, there would be something, something, something wrong. And, um, my mother, I call my mom just one day in tears, you know, and she was like, you know, this is retaliation. They know that you want to file something you know, you've already, you're going through the motions because I I had gone as far as to talk to to Dennis Toner, who was the next person up after. Um, And Dennis Toner then was below Ted Kaufman. And there was was just like this protocol you followed. And uh, I eventually did talk to Ted Kaufman um, and Dennis Toner and Portly. Then wasn't even talking to me anymore. They, they, it was Dennis Toner that dealt with me. Mm-hmm. You know, up to this point, working for Biden had been kind of tense. How his public persona is very different than what mm-hmm. he's like to work. 
it's more like working for a corporation. It's very um, top down and it's very um, tense. And uh, he's not, he doesn't treat his staff that well. So in my opinion, that was my experience of it. And some other people that were complaining about it. I would leave abruptly. In fact, the position that I had, they were having trouble keeping a person in it. Um, mm. So I don't know what that's about, but that's one of the things that the interview they made clear is that people kept leaving and then they wanted me to stay and ask me if I had plans to stay. And I said, yes, that I wanted to make a career on the Hill and then I'd eventually like to run for office someday. Mm-hmm. And that was my, and when I came in, it was at this beautiful time, you know, this is before all the scandals, before the impeachment plan. This is when he first was president. I got to go to the inauguration. I got to go to the inaugural balls because I was working for Senator Biden. And it was this magical time, in a sense. I walked the Bridge of Hope, got to meet Maya Angelou, which is one of the highlights of my life. And it was just amazing and and wonderful. So I, I was like a puppy and with enthusiasm, you know. Right. This was a new job. I was so happy to be there. So I just went in with the attitude of doing everything I could to be, you know, a good employee to be there and I was very excited and honored to be there. And so did you serve drinks at that event? I did not. Okay. So did, okay. It, it kind of just went away. Right. I, I said no. And then when I said no, there was, I sort of got attitude about it. And then, um, I pushed back on another thing that had nothing to do with, um, you know, sexual harassment. I pushed back about the intern program because I was given a staff by Ted Kaufman, the chief of staff of resumes. And he told me, he directed me, firmly to hire DuPont um, employees, children only. Wow. And I pushed back and I said, I want to hire, we need more diversity and I want to hire some women and I want to hire from other places. Like you hired me. And then after this whole conversation, I was like, how did I get hired? I'm not from Delaware. I'm right. from West Coast. Like, right. So, um, so he said 50%. So he relented 50% and it was still just strange. So I'd have these interns that were, more diverse and working class. And then I had these really privileged um, interns. So it was that kind of stuff was happening. So there was like regular work challenges happening, right? So how much interacting did you have with Biden? I would, well, it's because I was there. I would see him um, on and off quite a bit, but wouldn't necessarily talk with him. He was always breezing out, breezing in with his people that would stay around him, usually the upper level staff. Um, and they usually kind of kept right with him. So, um, but once in a while I would see him and he would um, just do that thing that guys do, you know, when they look you up and down and then smile and yeah. stuff. It just was obnoxious. I mean, I, and back then I just accepted it for what it was. When I talked about this discomfort that I had, I was really timid about it. I found myself getting more and more like withdrawn and timid about um, speaking out because of the atmosphere and because so closed down about hearing about it she would just be like you know one of the things she said to me was you know the senator likes you you know most women would would really like that attention she goes you know I don't understand your attitude like what is the problem so it was it was you know I definitely felt um started feeling like I just didn't really belong there. It definitely wasn't a progressive office. Yeah. <laughs> it was definitely not like that then. I don't know what it would be like now, but um, I then the incident when I talked about um, the discomfort, like I said, I was told to just do what I was told. And mm-hmm. then it wasn't too long after that, that <laughs> called me in and said, I want you to take this to Joe. He wants it. He wants you to bring it. Hurry. And I said, okay. And it was a gym bag. She said, you know, take the gym bag. She called it athletic bag. And, um, <clears throat> you know, she said he was down towards the Capitol and he'll meet you. And so I went down and I was heading down towards there. And he was at first talking to someone. I could see him at a different distance and then they went away. And then um, we were in like the side. It, it was like the side area. And um, he was, he just said, Hey, come here, Tara. And then I, I handed him a thing and he greeted me. He remembered my name. And then it, we were alone and it was the strangest thing. There was no like exchange really. He just had me up against the wall. And, um, 
I was wearing like a skirt and, you know, business skirt, but I wasn't wearing stockings. It was kind of a hot day that day. And I was wearing heels. And I remember my legs had been hurting from the marble, you know, of the Capitol. Mm-hmm. Like walk. And I, so I remember that kind of stuff. I remember like that. And it was kind of an unusually warm day. And I remember I was wearing a blouse and he just had me up against the wall and the wall was cold. And I remember he, it happened all at once. The gym bag, I don't know where it went. I handed it to him. It was gone. And then his hands were on me and underneath my clothes. And, um, yeah. And then he went, Oh, he went down my skirt, but then up inside it. And he, uh, penetrated me with his fingers. And, um, I, uh, he was kissing me at the same time and he was saying something to me. He said several things and I can't remember everything he said. I remember a couple of things. I remember him saying first, before, like as he was doing it, do you want to go somewhere else? And then him saying to me when I pulled away, he um, got finished doing what he was doing. And I kind of was pulled back and he said, he said, come on, man. I heard you liked me. Mm-hmm. And, um, it's that phrase stayed with me because I kept thinking what I might've said. And I can't remember exactly if he said I thought or if I heard, but it's like he implied like he, like that I had done this, like, I don't know. And for me, it was like every, everything shattered in that moment because I knew like we were alone. It was over. Right. He wasn't trying to do anything more, but it's, I looked up to him. He was like my father's age. He was this champion of women's rights in my eyes. And I couldn't believe it was happening. It didn't see, it seems surreal. And I I just, I knew, I I just felt sick because he, when he pulled back, he looked annoyed and he looked, and he said um, something else to me that I I don't want to say. And then he said, I must have looked shocked and he grabbed me by the shoulders. I don't know how I looked, but I must have looked something because he grabbed me by the shoulders and he said, you're okay. You're fine. You're okay. You're fine. And then, um, he walked away and he went on with his day. And what I remember next is being in the Russell building, like where the big windows are and the stairs by myself and my, and my body, I was shaking everywhere because, and it was cold all of a sudden. And I was, I don't know. I felt like I was shaking just everywhere and I was trying to grasp what had just happened and what I should do or what I should say. But I knew it was bad because he was so angry. Like when he left, like I could feel, you know how, when you know someone's angry, they don't necessarily say anything. Like he smiles when he's angry and you can just feel it emanating from him. Like, right. So then I went home and, um, I called my mom because, um, I didn't know who else to call. And she was wanting me to go make a police report. Like right then my mom was very adamant that I do that. And, um, very strong about me doing that. And I said, no. And we had like an argument about it. Um, and I said, mom, you can't do that. And she had known about the other stuff and had encouraged me to document it, which I did and go to the protocol about the sexual harassment. And then after this incident, I, I did follow her instructions and do that part. Hmm. But I didn't talk about what happened, and I was too. I tried to bring it up to <laughs> um, later, and she just wouldn't hear it. She like shut me down before I could even get there, and um, said, "I can't believe you're trying to bring bring things like this up." And she said, "How can I bring this to Ted Kaufman? He'll just think we're all on our periods." Wow. And she could tell you were talking about something more than the harassment, or she was just saying that about the harassment. Um, I don't know. I don't. I can't. I, I, I can't project onto like what that conversation was. Cause I was starting to tell her she didn't know. I didn't tell her. I started to try to go right. there and she like, shut it down. Right. Got it. Yeah. Like, I don't want to hear this. Like that's enough. Like, you know, kind of basically letting me know, like if I didn't like it, I could just go. And so I, it wasn't too long after, um, when I would see Biden after that, um, he would just not look at me not he looked angry like he would get this look on his face and like like, look you know how someone walks by instead of greeting you and smiling like they normally do they won't look at you he was pissed right so then the final interaction I had was it was a mandatory meeting um where I had to be there and he came up behind me 
and put his hand on my shoulder and then put his um, thumb or finger, I don't even know what, but up and down my neck in the back. I have thick hair and it's in the back of my hair. And, and I remember I just froze because I didn't know what that meant. And it just was uncomfortable. And I, again, told my mom about it because it was just weird. And mom said, you know, that's just um, power. He's trying to dominate you. So this was after, because this was after the assault had happened? Wow. Yeah, yeah. This was the last kind of time I ever really interacted, because they, they put me in a um, windowless office. I didn't have the one with a window anymore, I had, and I was cut off from staff. I was not supervising the interns anymore. I was not doing, I was literally, my job was to show up and just look for another job. I wasn't allowed to go to legislative hearings, nothing. So, But the chronology was that I was then looking for a job in, in June. I was volunteering for the RFK Memorial, the 25th anniversary. I did the VIP tent. And I was talking to Kennedy's, a person in Kennedy's office who was trying to help me backdoor, trying to like, like get them to stop what they were doing. And anyway, technically, I think um, my Senate record goes till August, but I remember leaving before then. Um, so, and I didn't have a job. I couldn't get a job. Um, once like word got around unofficially about my trying to file a complaint, filling out a form and stuff. It's like, I, no one, no one on the Hill. Uh, usually I would get like, when I would send out resumes, I would get responses right away. I just want to make sure I'm clear on this. You consider like rep reporting the harassment? I did try to complain about the harassment internally, but I was going through protocol. You go to your supervisor first, then to Dennis Towner, then to Ted Kaufman. Like I was following the protocol, how you did it, right? Yeah. Um, but um, they didn't do anything. Right. And then it got worse. And then that happened. So then I went outside and tried and there was like this office set up and I can't remember if it was in the Rayburn movie, Rayburn office building, or if it was in the, or I, it was, it seemed to me like it was in congressional office building, not the Russell, Russell Senate, um, Longworth or Rayburn. And it was this little tiny office and you go up and there was literally a clipboard and I filled out a form and someone kind of was just at the window, but it was weird and it wasn't very confidential and it was just odd. So I filled out the form and I know it existed. Um, they took it and then I don't know what happened to it. Um, so I've tried to track that form down and I was told it was probably returned to Biden's office. So it's an archival material. Okay. So, okay. So you, there's sexual harassment that you witness and experience, or you go through protocol. Then nothing happens. Then um, you are you have the incident in the alcove with Biden. You tell your mom. She encourages you to file a police report. You say no, but I will do something external about the harassment, not the assault. Right. Yeah. Okay. And I thought about trying to talk about it. I did. I tried. I just couldn't. I couldn't. Even now, like, I, it's so hard. Uh, and I don't. And I mean, I, I've worked as an advocate for domestic violence cases and help kids and I help, you know, whatever. But it's just. Um, there's just there was no framework back then. And to be really clear, I my mom educated me after it happened that it was sexual assault. I felt I felt like it was my fault, like mm -hmm. that I did to bring it on and the reason they, when after the whole drinks serving the drinks thing happened um things got really tense for me and it's like my supervisor kept finding fault with my work like all, all of a sudden I was doing things wrong all of a sudden mm -hmm. and then she took side and sent in an assistant and said we want you to wear different clothes you need to button up more you need to wear a longer skirt like in other words she and she said don't look so sexy she was like really inflamed about it and she goes try not to be so noticed you're too noticeable the other person was more awkward about it. She was just like, um, it's not coming from me, but they're telling you to wear longer skirts and button up more. And, and you're a little too provocative. Right. Is the word to use. right. Whatever. So you guys feel free to, um, go look up the rest of that and listen to it. It's about an hour long, I believe. So I don't want to play the whole thing, but you got the gist of, of what happened. And, that is who we're supposed to be putting up against Trump. Seriously? Um, I forgot to put it online on here so you can see it, but let me see if I can find this screenshot I took the other day. 
One second. All right, here we go. MSDNC. So we'll find it on here. So we're supposed to be putting this guy up against Trump, who's also a known racist, or ra racist too, but rapist and racist. Um, and he can't even, Biden can't even debate. I mean, here we go. This is what I was looking for. Trump's going to annihilate him in the debates if he even has one. Trump has over 50 um, credible female accusers. Biden has seven and Bernie has zero. And for all of you saying, oh, I wish that, uh, you know, Bernie would have gone ahead and, you know, too bad it's too late. That's bullshit. There's 1400 delegates left. So, and he, and, uh, Biden's only up by 300 delegates. And if you look at the, uh, discrepancies in the polls, the UN should be calling out the fraud right now. It is ridiculous. So they can't call out each other on this. They can't call out each other on um, endless wars. They can't call each other out on taking money from big pharma, big oil, all that stuff. They are the exact same fucking person. Okay. I don't care that this asshole was a VP to a black guy. That black guy just because he's black doesn't mean he was a good president, okay? Just like if Hillary would have won, doesn't mean she would have been a good president just because she's a fucking female. That president that this asshole went or uh, served under took us from two wars to seven, okay? This is the problem. The establishment is the problem. We would have known by now. Trust me. They're trying to look for any dirt they can. So Bernie won't be president. And they haven't found any. That's why they revert back to Russian asset, Russian intelligent, Russian agent, all that shit. For anybody calling this stuff out. So um, Jimmy Dore, actually, I fucking love this guy. He has the best quote about this. So uh, I wanted to share this little clip. I've said Joe Biden is worse than Trump because he's had more opportunity to do horrible things and he's done them. You know, Donald Trump wrote an editorial about the, uh, about the, uh, the Central Park Five saying that they should be imprisoned. Joe Biden actually put black people in prison. Yep. Crime bill. Uh, Joe Biden actually engineered the system that kicked people out of their houses. Joe Biden actually sent people to die in Iraq. Joe Biden wants people to die in Syria. Joe Biden helped people die in Libya. Joe Biden is why we have Trump. Yep. People were so desperate after eight years of Joe Biden that they voted for Donald Trump because they're desperate. And didn't Not want Hillary. Not because they're assholes. Because they're fucking desperate. And they're proving it to us again. They're not taking care of anybody. Yep. Demented, raping, death rattle. Joe Biden. What if Trump starts calling him the raper? That'd be nice if he started doing that. And then everybody would hear, hear her story. What a, what a, Joe Biden. This is this is who the de this is your Democratic Party giving you Joe Biden and everybody's gonna fall in line behind him. <laughs> Everybody already did, except for Bernie. It's coming. This is your uh hold on, I'm sorry. This is your opposition party, supposedly. The Democrats who give everything that Trump asks for to him. Endless budgets. Like, give me a fucking break. I don't know why more people don't understand this. It is so fucking stupid. It is not, oh, good guy versus bad guy. These guys are fucked up and they work for the same goddamn fucking people. 
And every time I try to say that, people take it as, oh, Trump's, you're, you're a Trumper? You uh, are a Trump empathizer? Absolutely no fucking way am I. I fucking hate that man. He's a piece of shit. Equal piece of shit is Joe Biden. There is no difference here except for dementia. That one's got it. That one might. I don't know. I highly doubt it. He's got other shit wrong with him. But that one has fucking dementia. And they are trying to prop him up as our next goddamn president. And that is bullshit and it's never going to fucking happen. Because after I vote in this primary, as a lot of other people, I am dem exiting. I will not be a fucking Democrat anymore. I am going to be a no party person. This is bullshit. And we don't have two parties in America. We have one. We have the, the ruling elite against the working people. So... If you don't uh, believe what I say, or if you would like to argue with me, I mean, the proof is right here, guys. Seriously. I don't understand how you can point at one and say they're so terrible and not look in the fucking mirror for the one that you're trying to prop up. Give me a break. Neolibs are the worst. I would rather have someone stab me in the front than in the back. That being said... If you have a primary coming up, vote for Bernie. Write in Bernie's name, whatever you got to do. And uh, after this, all this fucking pandemic, we got to yellow vest up and get out on the streets, man. So have a great day. I will probably make another video or two um, today and drop that as well. So please like this video, hit the thumbs up. Share it on your social media so everybody's aware of the crap going on here. Um, don't forget to subscribe to this channel, and, uh, this is another thing I was going to say, and I totally forgot. Thank you, MSDNC. Quote, statistics like these make me the face of the Believe Women slash Me Too movement so proud to support Vice President Biden, end quote. Alyssa Milano. This is the system, you guys. Share this, like this video, uh, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell notification so you know when a video drops, and until next time, Medicare be with you.